Yeah. Do you do you want to try and share your screen? Okay, let me try. Do you see it? Yes, I can see it. Okay. So shall I start? Yes. Do you want to try and go full screen or is it? Uh, Sorry? Do you want to try and, and go full screen? Okay. Does it work? Uh, okay, no. I guess it's no? Not. Yeah, no, it's full screen. Okay. Thank Good. you very much. Thank you. So, uh, so the last speaker is Evgeny Akhmedov, and uh, he's going to tell us about uh, relic neutrino detection through angular correlations in inverse beta decay. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and good, good morning, depending on where you are. I'm going to discuss an approach, a possible approach to detection of relic neutrinos, cosmic neutrino background. Okay. Uh, in this audience, I don't need much introduction to explain what their cosmic neutrino background is. Um, uh, it was, I mean, these are neutrinos produced in the very early stage of the uh, expansion of the universe at about one second after the Big Bang, at temperature of 2 MeV, roughly, which um, cooled down in the course of the universe expansion and at present expected to have uh, nearly Fermi Dirac spectrum uh, with temperature about two degrees. Okay. Uh, according to the standard uh, neutrino picture, three flavor picture, at least two of the three relic neutrino species should now be non-relativistic. And in addition, an important point, which is not much discussed in the literature, is that all these neutrinos is irrespective of whether they were produced in charged current or neutral current interactions, at present must be in the mass eigenstate. Uh, why would we know what we, why would we want to, to detect them? What we're expecting to, to learn from this? First of all, relic we want to know whether relic neutrinos are still there, whether they are stable enough against decay or annihilation. Then what is their composition? In particular, are there any sterile neutrino components? What are their energy spectra? Are there any non-thermal contributions, for example, coming from the decays of heavy relics? What are the velocity and spin distributions of relic neutrinos? Uh, are there any anisotropies, anisotropies like in the cosmic microwave background? Uh, is there any gravitational clustering? And so, Relic neutrinos must carry a wealth of information, uh, probably much more information that the cosmic macro background uh, bears. Um, and in particular, because they are expected to be produced at much earlier time in the uh, course of the evolution of the universe. In addition to giving some important uh, information on cosmology, they may shed light on the problem of whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles. Unfortunately, up to now, they have not been directly detected. And the reason is that they have extremely low energies and uh, their interactions are very weak. So um, there were a number of suggestions of how to detect them so far, but all of them but one are either float on uh, either based on flawed considerations, which means rough, I mean, simply incorrect, or fall short of the required sensitivity by many orders of magnitude. And out of all the suggestions so far, only one has some um, uh, promise to bear fruit in the foreseeable future. This is neutrino capture on beta decaying nuclei. So if we have a beta unstable nucleus, which undergoes, for example, beta minus decay, then the inverse beta process in which neutrino is captured on this nuclear doesn't have any threshold. It is an exothermic reaction. And therefore neutrinos even of extremely small energies can be detected. Moreover, the cross section of such reaction at low energies is inversely proportional to the neutrino velocity, just like in the case of the capture of thermal neutrons. 
And therefore, the product of the velocity times the cross section in the limit of vanishing velocity is finite. It doesn't go to zero. So neutrinos, even at extremely of extremely small energies, can be detected with finite uh, detection rate. This idea was first put forward by Weinberg back in 1962, and Weinberg, mm, in his idea, uh, his proposal assumed that neutrinos are massless, but have a large a chemical potential. They're fermi degenerate with large chemical potential. Why is it so? Why is it necessary? The point is that if we detect such process, inverse beta decay, the only way to discriminate between the usual beta decay and the, the capture of neutrinos is by detecting the uh, produced beta particles. And beta particles produced in the beta decay, usual beta decay, outnumber uh, electrons or positrons produced in the capture of relic neutrinos by huge number. If we take typical beta decay process and just compare the total number of electrons or positrons produced in it with the dose produced by capture of relic neutrinos, we see that the uh, beta decay dominates by a huge factor between 20 to 30 orders of magnitude. However, if we consider only a small energy window close to the um, final point of the uh, electron spectrum uh, of the width delta, then the ratio of the capture rate to the detect, detect, uh, sorry, decay rate is given by this factor for the allowed beta decay. And it doesn't depend on the Q value of the beta decay and given, is given by this expression. So even if we take the very narrow window close to the end point of the electron spectrum, of order of one electron volt, we have um, the huge amount of electrons or positrons from usual beta decay, which is about factor of 10 to the 11 larger than the number of electrons produced in neutrino capture. So that's a big problem. So the suggested way of discriminating between neutrinos, uh, between electrons coming from the beta decay or neutrino capture from relic neutrinos was to look into the part of the spectrum in which the usual beta decay neutrinos do not exist above the end point of the electron spectrum. Okay? So if neutrinos are fermi degenerate with large chemical potential, the capture of these neutrinos will produce the electrons with energies above those which are allowed for the usual beta decay. And by measuring them, if we have good enough energy resolution, we would be able to discriminate between um, the usual beta decay and the capture of relic neutrinos. However, uh, what Weinberg considered in his uh, proposal was the um, chemical potential as large as about 10 to the 5 or the temperature of neutrinos, which is now completely excluded by data. So this proposal doesn't work. However, this proposal was revived by Coco, Mangona, and Messina back in 2007. They noticed that since we know now that neutrinos are massive, one can use this fact to discriminate between the neutrinos, uh, electrons produced in beta decay and in the capture of relic neutrinos. If we consider the Curie plot for the beta decay, allowed beta decay, it's straight line for massless neutrinos. Uh, and the end point is given by essentially by the Q value of the beta decay. However, for massive neutrinos, it ends earlier at smaller, at smaller energies by the value m nu, because you need the energy at least m nu to produce neutrinos with the mass m nu. However, if you do not produce neutrinos but capture them, then you have more energy than in the case of massless neutrinos. And you can see on a monochromatic uh, relic neutrinos, you will see a discrete line, which is separated from the spectrum of the usual beta decay by twice the neutrino mass. Uh, the width of the line here is just given by the temperature of the relic neutrino background. So out of all the proposals, this is the only uh, current potentially feasible uh, 
uh, one, okay? However, in order to uh, implement it, you need extremely high uh, sensitivity uh, energy uh, to the energy of the produced electron, extremely high energy resolution, which should be at least smaller than the neutrino mass. That's a very challenging demand. Uh, at, at the moment, there's one proposal for such an experiment. This is a Ptolemy experiment, uh, which is planning to use tritium as a target with 100 grams of uh, tritium in the full experiment, which is about one mega curie of activity. And the number of expected events for the full scale experiment is uh, about 10 per events per year. And they have an ambitious goal to achieve the uh, energy uh, discrimination, um, energy sensitivity of order uh, of 0.05 electron volt. If the energy resolution is more than that, then it will not be possible to discriminate between the electrons coming from the usual beta decay and from the capture of neutrinos if neutrinos are uh, hierarchical in mass, only if they are quasi degenerate with a Real, um, the average mass much larger than that, then it would be possible to do it even with worse, uh, lower resolution than this one. So what I'm going to discuss now is a different idea. Instead of using the spectral properties of the produced electrons to discriminate between uh, the neutrino capture and neutrino decay, uh, so, and beta decay, uh, use the angular correlations, which are typical uh, property of beta processes. Beta decay processes exhibit a number of angular correlation. Probably the most famous one, the best known one, is a correlation between the spin of uh, parent nuclei in the case of decay of polarized nuclei and the uh, direction of the emitted electron. Uh, in particular, in the experiment with cobalt 60, Parity non conservation was first actually discovered in this kind of using this kind of angular correlation. The same angular correlation can be used uh, if, uh, as a correlation uh, between the spin of the target nuclei and the direction of the neutrino. But it was not discussed in the literature just because neutrinos are not detected, electrons are detected in the uh, beta decay processes. Now, if neutrinos are not produced, but are captured, like in the process of uh, relic neutrino detection through the inverse beta decay, this correlation will be the correlation between the spin of the target nucleus and the direction of the incoming neutrino. Now, how can it be used? We know that the solar system has a peculiar velocity with respect to the rest frame of cosmic neutrino background with the velocity uh, of of the order of the 10 to minus three in the units of, of speed of light. This means that we have some re relic neutrino wind at the earth. Relic neutrino, neutrinos come from some preferred arrival direction. So the angular correlation between the spin of, of the target nuclei, if the target is spin polarized and the direction of the uh, preferred um, velocity of the neutrino wind is given by this expression. And the coefficient here depends on the angle between this velocity u and the direction of the spin of the target nucleus. Now, the direction of neutrino arrival is fixed in space. And if the, the polarization of target nuclei is fixed in the earthbound laboratory frame, then because of the daily rotation of the Earth about its axis, this part, this term here, will exhibit time variation with 24 hours or nearly 24 hours periodicity. So the proposal is they use this periodicity instead of the spectral properties of the detected electrons to discriminate between uh, the electrons coming from the beta decay and from the relic neutrino capture. So this plot is just to illustrate this idea. So we have rotation of our Earth about its axis, and the direction of the preferred direction of the arrival of neutrinos is fixed in space. 
if we have the direction of the target spin polarization, uh, target nuclear polarization uh, in some direction, which is best of all orthogonal to the axis of the rotation of the earth, then with the rotation, uh, the angle between the direction of neutrino arrival and this spin of the target nuclei will change. So during 24 hour period, it will have one full circle. And therefore the probability of the detection will also exhibit this 24 hours periodicity. Now polarizing large detectors and maintaining the polarization during long time is a difficult task. So can we do without it? Can we use unpolarized targets? One possibility is to use uh, to measure polarization of daughter nuclei if the spin is not zero. For example, by measuring circular polarization of the excitation gamma rays in transitions from the excited states of final state nuclei to the uh, ground state, like in the famous experiment of Goldhaber, Grodzins, and Sudier. Another possibility is uh, to make use of the beta nu angle correlation, which is the angle correlation between the direction of the emitted neutrino and electron in the usual beta decay. In the inverse beta decay, it will be angle correlation between the direction of the captured neutrino and the emitted electron. It should also exhibit some time variation, in particular if we consider the asymmetry, forward backward asymmetry of emission of electrons with respect to some direction which is fixed in the earthbound laboratory frame. It will also exhibit 24 hours periodicity. Now, uh, I will not bother you with the technical details. I just consider it as an example, the gamma of Taylor transition one uh, to zero, or like in cobalt uh, 64 or bromine 80. There are many other examples and calculated these asymmetries for these particular transitions. So in the end, we have to deal with these two types of quantities. One of them is just the total rate of the detection if our target uh, is polarized, if the spins of the target nucleus are polarized. Then we just measure the total rate of detection and try to find its periodicity. Another possibility, if the target is not polarized, then we have to measure the, the direction of the emitted electrons and look at this correlation. Now coefficients beta and alpha are the usual angle correlation coefficients which depend on the type of transition or on actually whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles and they're typically of order one. Unfortunately, there's smallness here this parameter u is just the velocity of the neutrino wind, and it is 10 to minus 3, as I mentioned. Now, if we want to look at the small time variation, we have to be able to discriminate between very large background and very small time varying signal. And we also want to include the constant part of the detection rate of radiant neutrinos also included into the background because we're also only interested in that uh, periodic part the, with, uh, of the detection rate. So we have a challenge. We need to extract a periodic signal on the background of uh, extremely high signal which randomly fluctuates in time. This background includes electrons from the usual beta decay and also time independent part of the electrons coming from the uh, relic neutrino uh, capture, which is of course a small contribution to the background. Now the average large uh, level of the background, of course, is not a problem. The problem is that the background fluctuates and these statistical fluctuations of the background can in principle mimic time dependence of the signal. So we have to find a way of discriminating between these fluctuations of the background and the, the useful signal. Actually, the problem like this is met in many situations. It's kind of routinely met in uh, problems of astronomy, acoustics, radio detection, engineering, medical applications, so on and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, I am not an expert in this field, so I had to educate myself a little bit. Uh, 
to read some literature. And in the end, I came up with some very simplified approach, which is the analysis of the Fourier transformation and analysis in the frequency domain. So we consider the following signal. The total signal is a sum of the useful signal and the noise, where the useful signal is the periodic part of our signal, and the noise includes the, only the fluctuations of the background. The average, average background is assumed to be subtracted. But so the fluctuations may be quite large because of the large total level of the background. Okay? Now, uh, the usual way is, uh, which is used in the uh, signal processing uh, theory, is to consider the uh, quantities which are called autocorrelation of the signal and the noise. First of all, let me uh, notice that since we assume the average values of signal and noise to be zero just by definition, because we subtracted these average values, so the strength of the noise and the background are given by the average values of the um, squared that is by the variances. Now, uh, coming back to the outer correlation functions, it's just a product of the signal or similar to the noise by itself shifted by some time like tau and integrated over time. In the idealized case, we just assume infinite time of observation and integrate this quantity in the infinite time interval. Then uh, the signal uh, strength is just given, uh, the, the variance of the signal is just given by this outer correlation at zero tau, similar for the noise. Next, we uh, consider the uh, Fourier, Fourier transforms of the outer correlation functions of signal and noise. And in the simplified approach, which I started with, of infinite observation time, which is, of course, unrealistic, the outer correlation function of the signal is simple cosine, and its Fourier transform is the sum of two delta functions corresponding to plus and minus omega, and omega just related to the period of time variation. Now, about the signal, uh, the, sorry, the, the noise. The noise is just related to the quantum nature of the underlying process, in which, in this case, it's just a beta decay, and the discrete nature of uh, detected particles, which are electrons. So it's actually uh, the white noise, noise uh, more precisely, some particular case of the white noise, which is the short noise. And since the noise rate at different times is completely independent from each other of different times, uh, the different frequencies contribute equally to the spectral density of the noise, and therefore it's just constant. Therefore, the autocorrelation function for the noise in this approach is just a delta function. Now, if we just consider and compare these autocorrelation functions, we can see that it would be very easy to formally easy to separate arbitrarily weak periodic signal from noise just by taking tau, which is not zero, but at the same time doesn't uh, turn cosine here into zero. However, obviously that's not realistic. And the point is that the observation time is of course finite. Another point is that if we just consider the noise strength, which is obtained by integrating the noise uh, power uh, distribution over the full frequency interval from minus to plus infinity, we find that it will be infinite. Uh, again, unphysical result. And this is related to the fact that any realistic measurement, any realistic experiment is characterized by actually a finite interval of frequencies, finite bandwidth. So we have to take into account the finite observation time and finite bandwidth of the experiment. If we do that for the string strengths of the signal, we obtain this expression. So we have two delta light peaks, which would increase the height and decrease the width if we go to the limit of the increasing observation time. Uh, and then if we consider the noise again, it's just a flat 
spectrum, but it doesn't go from minus to plus infinity, but it's limited by the bandwidth of the experiment. Now the bandwidth is related to the shortest time interval, which can be proved by the uh, experiment. Essentially it's by the uh, Nyquist frequency. So if we have time binning at the experiment, this is just the inverse of, of the time bin. However, if it is a real time experiment, which is uh, better uh, for analyzing time structure of the signal, then it is the average time between two consecutive background events. So it's essentially the average background rate, and which I denote n node. So the bandwidth of our experiment is given by this expression. And uh, we have to compare now uh, the... All right, just to let you know, you have five minutes left. Okay, thank you. Should be enough. We have to compare the signal strength and noise strength integrated now not over the infinite interval, interval, but over the bandwidth of the experiment, okay? And if we do this, if we take the ratio of the signal to, to noise, we find the following situation. First of all, this ratio is extremely small. It is of the order of the signal of a background squared, which is extremely tiny quantity in our situation. Second, if we increase the detection time, the observation time, it doesn't help because both the numerator and the denominator will increase a square of the observation time and the result doesn't depend on this time. Similarly, if we increase the size of the detector, it wouldn't help because both the numerator and the denominator, the signal number and the uh, background number will increase in the same proportion. Again, quadratically in the mass of the detector. So this doesn't work. So the idea is to improve it by instead, by, by filtering, so-called passband filtering, filtering the signal in the frequency domain. Instead of integrating over all the interval of frequencies, integrate over the interval in which the signal is large and try to remove the noise by doing this. So instead of doing integration from minus to plus omega maximum, integrate just between the two nearest zeros or close to the each of the peak of the signal spectrum. So we can do that. And the result is that instead of this expression, we get the improved result given by this formula. Now, what we can see there that the improvement factor is huge because this is just about one quarter of the N0 T, but this N0 T is just the total number of the background events during the all observation time. It's really huge. So it's a huge enhancement factor. Then we can see that it increases with observation time, unlike this quantity, and it also increases with increasing uh, mass of the detector also unlike this quantity. We can compare this quantity instead of comparing it with unfiltered quantity, compare it with a signal to background, which is known to be small. And we see that the enhancement factor here is given by this expression in square brackets, which is just the total number of the detected useful events. So unfortunately, this is also expected to be a relatively small number. In order to fully solve the problem, we need this number to be quite large. So we did reduce the noise by this simple filtering in the uh, frequency domain. However, probably more sophisticated methods will be necessary. One of them can be um, the following one, suggested by something in the framework of astrophysics some time ago. We measured noise spectrum in the region where the signal is small, somewhere here. And then we use it, since using the fact that noise is flat, we use it to subtract it here, not just integrate everything here, but first we subtract the noise measured at the far away uh, regions of in the frequency domain. However, this has limited uh, potential because 
noise is not exactly flat, it's only approximately flat. There may be some other methods like using cross correlations instead of auto correlation, like it is used in the gravity detection experiments and many other approaches. So extensive signal and noise simulations are necessary for this. As I mentioned before, I'm not an expert in the signal processing, but I hope that some of the members of the, some of the participants of the conference are, and they may get interested in this point. I will be very happy in this case. So the conclusions. Uh, a new approach to the cosmic neutrino background measurement was proposed and based on the, was based on the capture on beta decaying nuclei, like suggested by Koch et al. and by Weinberg all there, but uses a different method of discrimination between relic neutrinos, uh, capture of relic neutrinos and usual beta decay. And it employs periodic time dependence on the angular correlation in the cosmic neutrino uh, background signal due to the peculiar motion of the solar system and the rotation of the Earth about its axis during the day. It doesn't depend crucially on the energy resolution. That's an important point. If the energy resolution in the Koch et al. suggestion is worse than the maximal neutrino mass, this method wouldn't work at all. In principle, the method which I suggest can work even for worse uh, energy resolution, even though the better energy resolution is um, uh, helpful would be helpful because it reduces the uh, background and simplifies discriminating between noise and background. Uh, angular correlation coefficient depends on the specific uh, transition. I consider the gamma material transitions like this one, but other transitions can also be all easily considered. And main challenge is, as I already mentioned, separation of big periodic signal from large fluctuating background. And in particular, because we are not uh, limited by very small energy resolution, nucleus with larger Q values of beta decay may be preferable and because they just lead to larger absolute detection rates. In order to, uh, be, to, to find the optimum uh, target, we need to look carefully for the uh, suitable nucleus, uh, taking into account a number of points like uh, lifetime and availability, type of beta transition, or ratio of the rates of neutrino capture and beta decay, feasibility of target polarization if we really want to uh, go on with a polarized target and so on. And probably we'll need, in any case, extensive simulation of the signal and background before we can decide whether uh, such an approach can be viable or not. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Evgeny, for this uh, um, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, so we have time for a few questions. You can just uh, raise your hand in the list. Um, so Ilyas, um, do you want to ask your question? Um, Evgeny, I have a very simple and naive question. Yes. Uh, if you were to build an experiment for this, how much of what order of magnitude would be the cost of that experiment? How much what, sorry? Would be the cost of that experiment? How I, big it has to be? I cannot say anything. So I can just mention Ptolemy. Ptolemy is going to use 100 grams of tritium. Uh, and it should be almost monoatomic layers because they need extremely high energy resolution. So 100 grams of tritium, you can imagine the cost. And also they're going to use graphene substrate to have monoatomic layers. And the area of this experiment should be in the full scale. They now have a prototype. The full scale will be about 50,000 square meters. So it will be quite expensive, uh, but certainly not as expensive as many current uh, high energy physics experiments. Regarding this particular approach or suggestion, which I discussed today, I cannot even uh, give a, 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 an approximate estimate because it's not clear which target should be used. First of all, it's not clear whether it's really doable or not. This is still a question. We need some more theoretical work before it has to be decided. Okay. Because as I said, the important thing is noise from background separation using the method of the signal processing theory 
in which uh, I'm not an expert. I just learned a little bit from reading some literature. And there is a huge literature and there are a lot of uh, experts in the field. So hopefully some of them can, can look into this issue and then it will be probably possible to say something. At the moment, I cannot give an even, uh, give an even approximate uh, estimate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I can see Norma also raised her hand. Uh, you want to ask a Thank you very much, Evgeny, for this uh, very uh, interesting uh, uh, proposal. I, I would like to ask, uh, in your improved uh, uh, signal-to-noise um, expression, um, uh, which is, uh, uh, how do you calculate, or which is uh, the expression for the amplitude, A0, because uh, it's important that that depends of the mass of the detector. And uh, uh, this uh, could be interesting to see. I mean, I, I would like to see more about that. OK, let me just come back to the general idea of using uh, beta unstable nuclei. So here, this is the ratio of the capture rate to detection rate, capture of relic neutrinos to, to just decay, decay usual beta decay of the target nucleus for allowed beta transitions. It doesn't depend on the, uh, on the nucleus. It doesn't depend on the Q value. It, all these cancels in the ratio. It only depends on the de density of relic neutrinos and it depends on the energy window in which you want to look into this. Now, coming back to, the, uh, to my proposal, you have to take into account on top of this that I want to have delta not too small, otherwise the proposal by Coco et al. will be better. So let's say 0.1 electron volt. So this would be, um, if you take cubes, so it should be 10 to minus eight, the ratio. But on top of that, there is additional smallness because of this small, uh, peculiar velocity of the sun, sun with respect to the cosmic microwave background. This will yes. reduce this by another three orders of magnitude. So again, we end up uh, with a quantity of the order of, of about 10 to minus 11. So we have to uh, fight to, to try to overcome this smallness by considering a very powerful method of uh, uh, discriminating between the noise and background. And again, we need to check uh, what are the most powerful methods uh, for this discrimination. I use a very simplified the first idea which came to my mind, actually, to use filtering in, in the frequency domain. Maybe some better ideas can be put forward. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yes, and at the end, you came with an expression which is uh, improve it signal to noise, I mean, in the yes, process. Okay. And then you have the amplitudes of this um, A0 in the improvement, in the improved uh, final expression, because uh, in order to have an enhancement, and that yeah. uh, uh, this A0, this amplitude, uh, uh, which this is zero. crucial, yeah. I think. In this. This yes, A0 yes, is... they are in the improved. Yeah. So yeah. this, uh, this, uh, um, do you have an expression for this I zero or uh, a mass dependence of the detector? This A zero is exactly this ratio which I discussed a minute ago. This is the ratio yes. between uh, signal uh, and background. The signal is uh, the useful signal, which is the periodic part of the detection probability. Not just the detection probability itself, but only the time dependent periodic part of it to the uh, background rate. And it depends on, uh, on the process, of course, and the ratio depends essentially on the energy window in which you consider it. The smaller the energy window, the better this ratio, but you cannot go to very small energy windows just because it would again require very high um, energy resolution. And do you, uh, I'm sorry, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I see there are other questions that we can discuss uh, later. Thank you. Okay, I so have another. Just, just, uh, maybe just one last uh, uh, remark. So if you look at this quantity, quantity this one, this 
factor. It's exactly this 10 to minus 11, roughly speaking, which I discussed before, okay? This is an enhancement factor. So you have to have, a, this is the number of the useful events, detection events of um, relic neutrinos, okay? So in order to save the, the, to overcome the smallness, you need to detect 10 to minus 11, to, sorry, 10 to 11 relic neutrinos, which is completely unrealistic, okay? If we do not use any better methods of discriminating between the source, this is already many orders of magnitude better than this, but yeah. still not sufficient because it's completely unrealistic that we will detect uh, 10 to the 11 relic neutrino events. Okay. So we need some better way of filtering. This is just an illustration of what one could achieve in a very simplistic approach. Maybe some better approaches uh, exist, like uh, the ones suggested by Samsung, which I mentioned before. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so maybe as a last question, Mikhail, you had a, a question you wanted to ask. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jenya. Uh, this uh, okay, I, I have a question. I wonder if you're familiar with the work by uh, Chuyano, Bayarsky, and others who say uh, that if you take Ptolemy experiment, th there is an effect which was not accounted for collaboration, which is basically zero point motion of uh, tritium on uh, this graphene plates. And so, sorry, sorry I, I cannot hear you quite well. Can you repeat the question? Uh, okay, I wonder if you're familiar with the paper uh, yeah. by, uh, so this question doesn't concern to your work, but it concerns to the Ptolemy uh, proposal, which, which you mentioned. Which, uh, so, sorry, once again, uh, the, the very last part of your question. So which proposal? Ptolemy. Uh, Ptolemy, yeah. Yeah, Ptolemy, okay. Yeah. There was a paper in January this year by- uh, You mean Ptolemy, Ptolemy paper? No, no, it's not Ptolemy paper. It's somebody else paper, a paper written by uh, Chiyano, Bayarsky et al, who say yeah. that uh, there is another uncertainty in Ptolemy experiment, which is related yeah. to zero point motion of uh, tritium atoms, which are sitting on the graphene plates, which uh, worsen considerably the accuracy of uh, okay. I understand. Well, uh, my yeah. question is, uh, can you comment on that? You think it's true? You think it's wrong? Are you aware of, of this problem? No, unfortunately, I don't know this paper. Uh, okay. Now, now uh, coming back to Ptolemy, mm -hmm. of course, there are a lot of problems. For example, you cannot use uh, molecular tritium mm -hmm. because of the rotational vibrational excitations of, of the molecule, which are exactly in the same range of energies which they are looking at. And there are many others, and maybe this uh, zero point motion which you mentioned, maybe just one of these uncertainties, I don't know. So I would expect that my proposal should be free of such a problem if it exists, because I'm not um, looking for very small energy resolution. Uh, their problems are all related to a tiny energy resolution. They really need, extremely small energy resolution of the order of 50 milli electron volt. That's really ambitious. And there are many contributions which come into a game at this level. So what I'm saying is that even if good resolution would help, it's not absolutely necessary for my proposal, unlike the proposal uh, which uh, Ptolemy is uh, going to use. But on the other hand, Ptolemy is um, intended not only to detect the relic neutrinos, they have many other interesting goals. For example, uh, get, put the better limit on the neutrino mass. And also they may be much better in a better situation if the relic neutrino background contains sterile neutrinos with relatively large mass, like one electron volt, which is currently widely discussed or like this. Then they may be in a much better shape. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I suggest we maybe uh, stop here. Um, uh, so I'd like to thank all the, the speakers of this session for, uh, for very nice presentations we had. Uh, so I think we have a 30